summarize this by quoting the Talmud that says that we have meant we may have mentioned this in the past, but that says that every human being really is a combination of two forces. We're uh, a half angelic and we're a half ape or animalistic. And really at every given moment, we have the, the, the decision to make. Are we going to act in an angelic way? Or are we going to act in an animalistic way? And in a way, this is exactly what Klipat Noga is about, what the theme of this chapter, chapter seven here in Tanya is about, that at every given moment, you know, most of our actions are mundane, are neutral. And we have that decision to make. Will we eat and then transform this act into a holy one by, first of all, recognizing that this is food from God and blessing the food. And then secondly, by using the energy that the food gives me in order to do a mitzvah, or will we act in an animalistic way? And really, of course, the goal, and that's what a tzaddik is in a way, the goal is to act divinely or in a holy uh, mundane, in a holy, sorry, in a holy matter, manner each and every time so that we elevate not just ourselves in that process, but also the world that we engage with in that process too. So that's the big idea. I know we spoke about God consciousness last time, but let's, let's continue. Like you said, Margaret, at the bottom of page 185. One who eats and drinks. Does anyone want to read? I'll read, Rabbi. Oh, thank you, Jonah. <laughs> All right. Okay. And his body temporarily becomes a garment and vehicle for it. One who eats and drinks merely to satisfy his bodily desires or acts similarly in other respects becomes a vehicle, an instrument, an expression of the forces of evil. In this sense, there is no difference between desire for what is permitted and desire for what is forbidden. The demarcation between holiness and profanity is not the demarcation between the permitted and the forbidden. Holiness is all that and only that which relates to God. Everything else, everything that is motivated by and relates to anything other than him, belongs to the realm of klipa. Thus, when a person indulges in his desires, even if permitted, he does not at that time relate to God. When a person decides consciously or unknowingly that he belongs to the world of klipa, he becomes a garment and vehicle for the profane husks that obscure the divine essence of reality. Right. I think that's an important point, that the difference between holiness and profanity is not the same difference as the forbidden and permitted, because one may be doing things that are entirely permitted throughout the entire day. I may not be touching the realm of forbidden. I may be doing everything that is permitted, even, even more than that. I may even be engaging in, in, you know, in, in mitzvahs, in good deeds, and still not be holy or not make them holy because I didn't relate them to God. I did them just for myself. Mm -hmm. I may be giving even tzedakah, but it's only for myself, for my good feeling, for my honor, for my plaque, for my whatever it is. So I really didn't do it for God. God wasn't even in the picture. And the second I don't do a good deed, even a good deed for God, then it doesn't become holy. Might be a good deed. Might be again in the realm of the permitted and the encouraged. But it's not in the realm of holiness because holiness is only that which is connected to God. Only that which intentionally is directed towards God. And I, I think it's an important thing because very often, I mean, we, we may feel good about ourselves and say, okay, we did this and we did that. One time, was it related to God? Did you do it just for your self-pleasure? Who was at the center? You or God? You know, uh, the, there was a great Hasidic Jew that had the pleasure of meeting. His name was Rabbi Yor Khan, um, who was also in charge of registering all the talks of the Lubavitcher Rebbe of blessed memory uh, by memory. Every single Saturday night, he worked with Simon Jacobson, who's been here, Rabbi Simon Jacobson, him and, and some others. But Rabbi Orkan was a senior rabbi. He passed away just about a month ago, uh, maybe a little more. And he would very often turn to people and say to them, is there a difference between you and a donkey? And they would say, what do you mean? <laughs> and then he would explain, well, one second, a donkey eats, a donkey sleeps, a donkey runs, a donkey carries things. The donkey does all sorts of things. But at the end of the day, donkey does all these things for himself. 
The donkey. So is there a difference between you and a donkey? Is there anything in your day to day that you are doing not for yourself, that you are doing for God? If yes, then there is a difference between you and the donkey. If not, you and the donkey are more or less the same. Hmm. It's, it's an extreme way of putting things, but, but it brings these words to life. Because if we don't relate things to God, we may be in the realm of the permitted, but we're almost like a donkey. Yes, Diana. Rabbi, it, it seems to me that it, it even goes beyond God. Because yes. when you're helping and, and, and you're doing it with God in mind, you're helping the rest of the world too. Yeah, absolutely. So you're doing it for the other, for someone else. It's beyond, I mean, right. it's God, but it's God and helping the world at the same time. Oh, very good. Very good. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so there's a, a, a verse in, in the book of Psalms. I think it's in, also in the ninth. In, um, I forget exactly which Psalm, either in the 80s or in the 90s, one of them. But it says like this, Hashem Sinuga. That God who the, those who love God hate bad. And it's true, I think, in every relationship. The more I love someone, the more I start to love that which he or she loves and to hate that which she or, uh, he or she hates. Not necessarily because I love them or I hate them, but because I'm so much in love with the other person that out of love, not just out of respect, but out of love for the other person, I also dis develop the same taste buds, so to speak. So I hate which that, that person hates, and I love that which that person loves. That's why they say that it's impossible not to love God and love, the, love his people at the same time. Uh, 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 and it's impossible not to love God and, love his, uh, uh, and not love his people. If you love God, you love his people. Because yeah. God loves his people. Yeah. If you don't love his people, that means you don't love really, you don't love God. Because the ultimate relationship again is when I love that which my beloved loves, and I hate that which my beloved hates. And therefore, those who love God hate bad, like King David says, because God hates bad, hates evil. So if I'm so much in love with God, then I have to hate that which he hates, and that's evil too. Now I think that's connected to what you said, Diana, because if I really love God, then I love the world, and I love bettering the world, and I love bettering the, the people of the world. Mm -hmm. But if I, if I don't have that type of connection, then maybe I don't really love God. <clears throat> it's true. I think in every relationship, uh, especially, you know, in, in marriages that are long lasting, you see that, that you, you, you almost, you know, you started a marriage in, in, with liking certain things. And then over the years, you start liking other things, that which your spouse likes more. Why? Because uh, you're just so much in love with your spouse that you become, uh, you've become, you've almost started liking that which he likes or he likes. I think it's true not just in marriage, but in every relationship. And it's certainly true with God. I think the reason why uh, uh, the, the, the holy people that you know our generation knew I'm, I'm thinking of Rabbi Steinzeltz um, that they did what they did they were in love with what they did is because God loved what they those actions so they themselves committed themselves to those actions whether it's the love for the people that they uh, worked with or worked for uh, or whether it's just even you know spiritual matters like prayer and so on because they came from that perspective of what does my beloved love and if my beloved loves that, who am I not to love? Mm. I think it's, it's connected here to what we're saying. That if I don't do things for God, then really I may miss the point altogether. But if I am in love with God and I do things for God just because I'm in love, then everything else will align and will become holy, therefore. Anyway, that's, that's more of the, the profound thought of this, of this idea here. But again, I want to hear your, your words more than my words. Yeah, I think, I think that, that love, part of that is accepting uh, meets vote that perhaps there's no real explanations for or things that we can rationalize as being something that we relate to or that we feel great about or right. um, 
you know, we, we had some chicken last night and about an hour later, I wanted a chocolate uh, dessert and uh, no can do. Now, but dark chocolate, know. yes. Dark, you should have a dark chocolate. The bitter one. Yeah, well, there's part of, part of chocolate, but yeah. we didn't have any. <laughs> so, so no, but it, that's that's part of it. You know, if you if you accept the, the laws of kashrut, um, you know, it's not necessary that you're in, in love with them, but you do it because you have a love of Hashem and uh, and you you continue to follow through on all those things. Right. No, very well said. You know, this was Robert Stanson's recommendation. I've heard him say this many times, but, but in line with what you're saying, and that is that I think everyone should have something in their day, in their every day, that they do just because. In other words, not, not because they want to do it, not because they feel like doing it. They do it just, just because God commanded them to do it. They actually don't want to do it. Mm -hmm. But in a way, that trains the person to become in line with God. That you do things for him, really. If you're doing it just because you, that you have no desire to do it, but you do it just because God commanded you, then in a way, it turns you into this vehicle for God. Otherwise, you're just a vehicle for yourself. Mm -hmm. Whether, again, it's, it's you know, not eating a certain food because you just ate meat or milk, milk food, dairy food, because you just have meat, like you just said, Jordan, or whether it's something else. Maybe, you know, it could be waking up 10 minutes earlier. You want to wake up at six, you wake up at 10 to six. Why? Just to control your evil inclination because God wants you to do so. It tells you, no, you should sleep a little longer. Or it could just be, you know, a, 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 just a good deed again, that I'm doing something that, that I don't necessarily want to do. I don't want to say a blessing over the food, as small as that. But I'm doing it just for God. Everyone should have at least one thing like that every day and in a way, it transforms our nature into a divine nature, into a holy nature. It, it, turn, it, it brings us into the realm of holiness, not just the realm of the permitted, like Rabbi Schnauz is saying here. And then once you become, by the way, once Rabbi Schnauz will also add that, that once you become accustomed, because if you do things uh, numerous times, then, then, then it becomes a part of your day. Then it's not, you're not doing them now against your will. They're part of your will. That's how the human nature works. So once you've become accustomed to that act, then you have to act and add another act. And that's how you grow in life. Each time you do, you add something else that you don't necessarily want to do, that you do just because God commanded you to do that. And, and then when you get accustomed to that, you add another act and another act, and it goes from strength to strength and forever and ever. All right. Okay, it is told. Let's, let's unless again, uh, please, Share your comments, ideas, anything else. Otherwise, we can continue here with this little story. Okay. Anyone that is told of the Holy Grandfather? I'll it's read it. Go ahead, Marga, please. Okay. It is told of the Holy Grandfather of Radoshitz that in his youth, before he became a Rebbe, he was terribly poor and often had nothing to eat. One year, after he had eaten nothing from Yom Kippur to the day before Sukkot, his wife sold a jewel she had and bought candles, challah, and potatoes for the festival. When he saw the candles and challah on his return from the synagogue, he was very happy, recited the Kiddush, washed his hands, and sat down to eat. Being very hungry, he ate ravenously until he suddenly stopped and said to himself, Burl, you are not sitting in the sukkah, but in the plate. Someone can be tending to the most basic needs of his body with his conscious intent be observing the mitzvah of eating in the sukkah, yet still be sitting in the dish and not in the mitzvah. All the same, even when a person eats to satisfy his lust, his body becomes a vehicle for klipa only temporarily. Right. So yeah, we'll get to that, but, but I think it's a powerful story. You're sitting in the plate, not in the yeah. sukkah. He was physically sitting in the sukkah, but mentally he was sitting in the plate which is a powerful thing. It reminds me, by the way, of I, 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 there was another Hasidic Jew that I knew in Jerusalem. And he once shared it at a Hasidic Fabrengen, at a Hasidic gathering, that whenever he would eat, and I noticed that, whenever he would eat, he would leave some of the food on the plate. He would, he would never finish the entire plate. Same when he drank. When he drank, whether it's a bottle of water or a cup of water, or whatever it was, he all, always left a little bit 
And uh, he mentioned that he, he was a Holocaust survivor. And even in the Holocaust, he followed that custom. Even though, as you know, in the Holocaust, they, they were what they received, potato peels every day, nothing to eat, but he would always leave something. And when they asked why, so he responded, that's so that I can remember that I'm, uh, that I'm divine and I'm not an animal. That I'm not, the food doesn't control me. I control the food. So I may want to finish that plate, but I exercise self-control so that I remember that I'm not living in the plate, like it says here. That's why, that's why I remembered of this. That I'm not controlled by the food. By the way, uh, uh, you know, Jewish halacha also suggests, speaks of this. And when, when one eats, speaking of food, you know, very often we go down to the food, especially with soup, for example, when you, know, you don't want it to spill or other types of food. Well, Jewish halacha suggests, Jewish law suggests that we should never go down to the food. The food should come up to us. Why? Because you're higher than food. The plate is under your control. You're not under the plate's control. So you go, you, so you bring the food up to you. You don't go down to the food as if you're enmeshed in it. But that's, that's a, a, a subtle behavior that, again, exhibits this, this, this type of, of, of idea that and we're in control. God, the, the, the divine being here is supposed to be in control, not the animalistic self that wants to go down and finish the entire plate. So it's, it's even expressed in small actions as such. Hmm. You know, they tell the story of the Baal Shem Tov that, by the way, the Lubavitch Rebbe would do the same thing, but that when uh, they would eat and bring up, say, a piece of fish, and that piece of fish would somehow drop, you know, sometimes it happens, right? You, you pick up your food with fork, and then the food drops off the fork or falls on the floor or falls back on the plate or wherever else. They wouldn't continue to eat that piece of fish. Why? Because they would say, oh, this food is not ready to be elevated yet. Mm. The fish is not ready to be elevated yet. So when we eat fish, right, and then we use it for divine service, then we elevate the fish. But if it dropped, I guess it's a sign that it's not willing to get mm. it, so they wouldn't touch the piece of food anymore. But it shows you that, you know, food, even such a mundane act, can really be a very holy, holy exercise, a holy act. If we can relate to it as such, depends a lot on the intention, but it starts with us being in control, not going down or not, not being animalistic when we eat. And at the same time, it also starts with the intention that we're doing this to elevate the food and to, to elevate God altogether. But that's, uh, that's what it means to, to be sitting in a sukkah, not sitting in a plate. Okay. Let, let's continue, unless again, some more comments, questions, ideas, disagreements. Okay, we can continue until such, a t until such time that the person repents. So now, if a person was immersed in his food, did act completely for himself, or was animalistic about his behaviors, then what happens? So these, so we said that these actions now remain in the domain of the klipa, of profanity but they can still be redeemed from the domain of profanity as long as they were permissible actions, right? Um, how so? So let's continue. Until such time that the person repents. Does anyone want to read now and returns? I'll go Jordan or anyone else. Here, I'll read. Okay, thank you. Okay, until such time that the person repents and returns to the service of God and his Torah. For inasmuch as the meat was permissible and the wine was kosher, they can revert and ascend with him when he returns to the service of God. The meat that he eats and the wine he drinks become part of his body, part of the vital force that empowers him to function and achieve. So when he subsequently involves himself with Torah and mitzvot, he does this with the body and the energy that the meat and the wine generate. Thus, when he elevates his life to holiness, all that has sustained his life is elevated along with him. In the same way that he previously served as a garment and vehicle for klipa, he can now revert to being a garment and vehicle for holiness, redirecting the material substances he had previously ingested to serve his Torah study, 
prayer and performance of mitzvot. This can be done despite the fact that at the time he did not ingest these substances for the purpose, for this purpose, which is why at the time he was a vehicle for klipa, provided that the food was mutar, permissible for consumption by the Torah. Right, because it's not completely in the forbidden realm, which also means, as you'll explain, uh, in prison. Here it's in some, somewhat of a realm that's not in prison, and therefore it can still be elevated. So the food that we ate, even though we ate it selfishly or just, just, just for ourselves, for our self-pleasure, like animals, then can still be redeemed if at one point we did the shuva. In a way, it reminds me, even though this is speaking about the forbidden realm, but it reminds me of Reish Lakish, uh, the Talmudic sage, who was a bandit before he became a Talmudic sage. A, a, a bandit that was, you know, that people feared. And one day Rabbi Yochanan, another Talmudic sage, was swimming in the river and he sees this bandit, Ray Shlakish, jumping from one side of the river to the other. And he tells him, why? You have such strength. Imagine you could invest all of this strength, towards Torah. You would become a great scholar. And uh, he told Rabbi Yochanan, that's great. Thank you for mentioning this, but what are you going to give me in return? Mm. And Rabbi Yochanan was a very handsome man. And he said to him, look, my sister is much more good looking than I am. If you invest every strength that you have in Torah, I'll convince your si my sister to marry you. Yeah. So Rishlaki said, a deal. And he went and invested all of his strength in Torah. And indeed, he became a great Talmudic scholar. And he eventually married the sister of Rabbi Yochanan. And Rabbi Yochanan became his teacher. Rabbi Yochanan was his brother-in-law and his teacher at the same time. And it was a very beautiful relationship between them and a very tragic ending also. But Rabbi uh, Reish Lakish at one point became a teacher of himself. And he had many students too. And he's quoted in the Talmud many times. And one of his main teachings is that when a person does teshuva, then zdonot nasulos chuyot, that his uh, misdeeds in the past turn into uh, good deeds, turn into mitzvahs. Even sins can turn into mitzvahs. And he was a living example of that. Now, um, uh, how so? Because as the Tanya explains here, that they may, may be imprisoned. Your, your misdeeds causes all this energy to be imprisoned by the profane klipot or by the profane real. But when you do teshuva, then it's transforming everything that you did in the past into another holy real, exactly as the Tanya explains here. By the way, there was a great, you know, uh, 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 one of the great Hasidic masters we've quoted many times, Rabbi Levi Tzachabadichev, once saw someone sinning and sinning and sinning, and he said to him, you know, I'm very jealous of you. The man says, what, what do you mean? He says, because you have so many sins. When you do teshuva, all these sins are going to turn into mitzvahs. You're going to be on a such high level, much higher than me. Hmm. Man said, wow, you should come back next year. You'll see how many sins I have then. Yeah. <laughs> but eventually it penetrated, and he did teshuva. And indeed, because we really believe that teshuva is the transformation of the past not just the escape or the exit from the past. It's really the transformation of the past. Why? Because the past is still a part of you, either biologically, like the Tanya explains here, or even emotionally, spiritually, it's a part of you. You can't escape your past. There's no such thing, but you can transform it. If you use your past in order to, 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 to learn from it, maybe use it as, as years of experience, and then, the, and then you repent and you, you, you realize, oh, all this was designed by God for me not to be where I am today and to serve him the way I am today, thanks to this path, then you've transformed your past. And then really, your zdonot nasulos chuyot, like Reish Lakish says, your sins become merits. Now, um, in, a, in a mystical way, this is how this happens, that the energy that is imprisoned by the klipot now is released, but there's still energy there. And it's, it's released towards divine, uh, the divine real, towards the holy real. <clears throat> Just to conclude the story, but Reish Lakish and Rabbi Yochanan had a tragic ending. It's just one of the most tragic stories in the Talmud. But uh, one day, you know, Reish Lakish would, would ask at least 24 questions. 
every class of Rabbi Yochanan. Rabbi Yochanan loved that because that's what Judaism is all about, questioning. And one day he asked a question about the subject matter of the day, which was a specific arrow, whether this arrow can become impure or cannot become impure. In general, the law is that a finished product can become impure. If it's unfinished, it cannot become impure, right? So if, it, if say for example, a dead body touched an unfinished product, in, in most cases, it doesn't become impure because it's unfinished. But if it's a finished product, say a chair that's already built, then it becomes impure. So there was this arrow that they were talking about, whether it's considered finished or unfinished. And they don't know, therefore, whether it can become pure or impure. So Rabbi Yochanan, the teacher, made the mistake of telling his student, Reish Lakish, you should know about these arrows. You were a bandit once upon a time. Mm -hmm. So you would know the answer. And Rish Lakish had left his past that transformed it. So, 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 you know, 180 degrees that he took these words as an insult. Mm. And he told Rabbi Yochan, what are you talking about me, the bandit? I'm, I'm not that bandit anymore. Why are you even mentioning this? Mm. He was so insulted that he died of a heart, heartbreak. Mm. Rabbi Yochanan was so hurt that he had insulted, that he had spoken so, so, so automatically to his student and insulted him in that way, that then he died of a heartbreak. Oh my God. And that was the end of their relationship. But that's also comes to teach you how careful you have to be with your words. Wow. That these were, these were, this, this was a beautiful relationship they had. Again, it wasn't just a teacher, but he was the man that, that saved him from, from being that bandit. He was uh, his brother-in-law. But he reminded him of his past, so, so it became, that's why the, the Rambam actually has that as Jewish law. I know we're deviating a little bit, but, but still, it's important to, to note. Maimonides mentions, and it's, 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 in, it's, it's a law, that you are not allowed to remind the Baal Teshuvah, the person that does Teshuvah of his past. Because that past is not him anymore. He transformed it. So it's not him anymore. So you're actually speaking about someone else. So you're defaming the person by reminding him of his past because you're attaching him a persona that that's not him anymore. That doesn't belong to him. So you're not allowed to remind about the shuva of his past, the person's returns of his past. And uh, in a way, Rabbi Yochan really caused such heartbreak. It's just, just, just tragic by doing so. So you have to be, be careful. In any case, but the point is, the teaching of Reish Lakish, that your past can be transformed. Mystically, it works with the energy being released from the profane realm to the holy realm. And also just practically, it works because you're using the experience of your past in order to do good. And you're recognizing that the past was designed by God for you to be who you are today and to do the good that you are doing today. So your past can indeed be transformed.